Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. With your Fed decision, here's Mike McKee. Two dots, no rate move. The median of the 19 Fed officials' projection for rate cuts this year moves to two from three in March. Policymakers are quite divided, however. Eight members see just two cuts this year. Seven see only one. Four vote no change. They now have four penciled in for 2025. Although uh, the range is so wide, it's almost meaningless. The neutral rate also moves up. The median now 2.8% from 2.6%, although they don't get there until after 2026. Nine members see neutral as 3% or higher, one as high as 3.75%. The Fed's target range stays in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent. No change in the 2.1 percent GDP projection for 2024, two percent for next year. No change in the four percent unemployment forecast for this year, though 2026 moves up a tick from March to 4.2 percent. It's PCE inflation where we see the biggest change in the forecasts. Headline of 2.6 this year, up from 2.4% in the March projections. Next year, 2.3 from 2.2. Corp PCE is forecast at 2.8% this year, up from 2.6%. Next year, also 2.3 from 2.2. Inflation was the only significant change in the statement following today's better than expected CPI. The statement now says, In recent months, there has been modest further progress toward the committee's 2% inflation target. The decision was unanimous. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. If you were looking for fireworks in financial markets, you missed it all. It happened about six hours ago at 8.30 Eastern time. And the equity market, some of these moves stick on the S&P 500, still positive by about 0.9% on the Nasdaq, up by more than one full percentage point. Two-year yields, Elisa, just off the lows of the session, but still down 12 or 13 basis points to 470 on a two-year. There's nothing that would really shake up what we saw earlier. It is interesting, though, that they did increase their expectation for core PCE inflation to 2.8% versus 2.6%. And it raises the question about the idea of are they tacitly allowing inflation to go be two point something to Mohamed Alarian's point rather than exactly 2% as they allow this to happen even with two potential rate cuts baked in. TK, what's your takeaway? My takeaway here is that 830 was really, really important and it moves us right on to all the other economic data. And I go back to economic growth and it's a surprise this year that we get more buoyant economic growth than a lot of the gloom crew is talking about. I want to get back over to Mike McKee. Mike, just briefly, just work through that again for us. Explain to us where that median dot is. We were looking for three cuts in the median dot last time around. Where's that median dot for 24 now? The median dot is at uh, two cuts for 2024, four for 2025, uh, but the range has narrowed (coughs) considerably, but still broad because uh, there are at this point eight members seeing two cuts this year, so that makes it the median. Seven saw only one and four voted for no change. So they seem quite divided, which would suggest that at this point uh, there is no consensus on the committee about what's going to happen the rest of this year. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Mike McKee will be in that news conference in about 27 minutes' time when it kicks off with Chairman Powell. Bramo, any early questions for Chairman Powell in this presser based on that? Uh, Yeah, I do. Number one, how long will you tolerate inflation above 2%? How quickly is an okay pace to move to get inflation down? And the second thing, I'm still thinking about this. One participant had a new uh, neutral rate proposal of 3.75%. That's pretty bold. I mean, it's pretty much in line with where markets are for 3.5%. Nonetheless, that resets a lot of questions about market valuations that maybe on the margins could really uh, change investment theses. Joining us now to discuss is Mohammed Al Aaron of Queen's College, Cambridge. Bob Michael at JP Morgan still around the table with us. Mohammed, I want to come to you first. Get your view on these forecasts based on what we learned early this morning at 8.30 Eastern time. So I wonder, John, whether those forecasts fully reflect this morning or whether they were, they were finalized before this morning. Um, I was surprised to hear that four voted for no cuts. And I was surprised to see the inflation numbers go up. Um, both at, at for the PC, both at headline and core. So the only the one question I would have for Chairman Powell is: Do those numbers 
and the expectations that four people had of no wage cuts <coughs> reflect this morning's inflation data or not. Mohammed Tomkin, good morning and good afternoon, I should say. Good late afternoon and evening to you. Somebody today echoed Peter Orzag a long time ago of LSE. That's a school, a Maham itself, uh, west of Cambridge. And Peter Orzag talked about glide pass. Is our great underestimation that the glide pass to get out of the pandemic with all this monetary policy is a much longer time frame than we think? We're modeling Fed meeting to Fed meeting the silliness of September and December, where we should be modeling 2027. We should, Tom, and I've been urging to combine data dependency with more of a forward-looking view of the economy, but that's not where the Fed is, and as a result, that's not where the markets are. Um, the markets are reacting to every single data point. In the last month, just the last month, 10-year yields went up 30 basis points, came back down 40 basis points, went back up 20 basis points, and came back down 40 basis points. Um, and what you realize is that there's no anchor. There's no longer-term anchor to markets, and there's no longer-term anchor to policies. Uh, we should be talking about the big secular changes and how that's going to impact the next 12 months. But that's not where the Fed is, and therefore that's not where the markets are. Right now, I wonder how significant it is to you, Mohammed, that we did see at least one participant materially mark up their long-term neutral rate as people uh, try to understand what this means longer term for what a Fed rate cutting path could look like. It's about time. I mean, you know, there was a very active discussion of what's happening in the structure of the economy and why it is that the neutral rate is well above three, nearer to four. Um, but the Fed is moving very slowly on this. And Fed Chair Powell has refused to engage in discussions, um, either saying, I don't care about it, or I don't have a view about it. Um, so yeah, it's about time. They're going to have to really think about this. But again, Lisa, that is a forward-looking parameter. And this is a Fed that focuses excessively on the past and, and doesn't want to signal much about what's ahead. So if you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity is still firmer by 0.9% on the S&P 500. We were higher by more than one full percentage point. Just undoing some of the moves in the bond market on a two-year yield. Yields are lower still by 12 basis points. They were lower by a little bit more than that earlier on. There was a lot of interest in the median dot for 2024. Just want to clarify something that Mike was saying. They're now signaling they expect to cut rates only once this year compared to the reduction of three, which was kind of signaled back in March, Bramo. So that's the change we were looking for. Would we come down for two? Two or to one. It looks like we've come down to one. But 2025 kind of makes up for some of that in some way. Which is what some people were saying is that you just basically push it out to the following year, which is why it might not have been a massive deal. There was a big question mm -hmm. before this whether or not it would matter to markets on the margins. Maybe you take back some of the gains in certain bonds uh, right now. Nonetheless, not a huge shift when you look at the overall cutting cycle. Well, Michael, I've got the 10-year yield just touching two standard deviation move. It's not a big deal. 4.28% percent and gyrating around what level of 10-year yield do you need to really signal to use Bullard's word a new regime? Um, <clears throat> it's not so much the 10-year yield as the front end of the curve. Yeah, okay. I, I think the front end of the curve, you've got to see the Fed start cutting rates and then the front end start coming down towards 4%. I think that will pull the 10-year down mm -hmm. as well a little bit. But there's an awful lot priced into well, the 10-year part of the yield. It's an curve. unfair question. I'm going to you know, ask you to speak for Michael Faroli and Kasman and the other economists at J.P. Morgan. Do they do harm to the American economy by being ex post and delaying? What would your economists say? They do no harm to anyone, that I'm pretty sure of. Look, I, I think when you look at market movements, you, you have to understand that there are different constituencies that are involved. We talk to a lot of very large plans that are waiting for the yield curve to disinvert because based on their investment analytics, it doesn't make sense for them to come out of cash into the longer end of the curve. There are other buyers out there that are looking to mm -hmm. park cash into safe dollar assets. So they're big dollar buyers, they want to own the dollar, and treasuries are the largest, most liquid way to do that. 
I have to say, I'm right now I'm, I'm parsing through the statement and all the details, and it's a confusing one. So let's just go over it. Four Fed officials see no rate cuts this year. That is up from two officials in the March projections. So that is a more hawkish tilt. Seven see one cut, while eight see two cuts. Honestly, we're looking at right now a narrow majority seeing no more than one cut this year as a base case. This, uh, according to the statement, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering, John, all the people who said this would be some kind of massive shift, it isn't being taken that way by the market as people parse through the longer term expectations for what the Fed hopes to accomplish and where the balance of risks is. Because we had a soothing number at 830 Eastern time. I think that's kind of the takeaway. Yeah. Is that right, Bob? Yeah, I think so. It's what it's what I started with. This is what you look for in the numbers. If there are a lot of people clustered around one dot, then they don't change their projections after the number. They've submitted them. They let them go. The fact that there were four with no change, seven with one dot, and only eight um, with 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 two dots, two rate cuts, tells me that they submit them, they don't do anything. The statement's completely different. The statement talks about modest progress continue to, continues to be made on inflation. Let's get Mike McKee back into the conversation before Mike goes into that news conference. Mike, just to clarify some of the comments you had earlier, your thoughts. Well, I uh, misspoke, <laughs> but uh, one cut. Uh, is the median dot this year uh, for this year. Uh, but uh, it is, as you say, com somewhat confusing because of the way they do it. But uh, looking out over the course of the year, the question is, when do they do it? Because their PCE projection is basically for the year where PCE is now. So that's going to be uh, a question for Jay Powell in his news conference. Mike, you get into the press, sir. Thanks for your time, sir. Happens to all of us. Looking forward to your coverage in that news conference with Chairman Powell a little bit later. Dan Swanke is with us from KPMG. I want to bring her into the conversation. Mohammed's still with us, Bob Michael as well. Dan, you've had about 15 minutes, 10 minutes or so to go over these numbers. What jumps out for you? Well, certainly the upward rise in inflation I was surprised at. I expected them to mark down inflation a little bit. So that is one that I think Mohammed also flagged. But I think what's important is we know that they've delayed the putting down, marking down of their dots on the dot plot. And that has become more of an iterative process to reflect more of a consensus of what they do talk about at the meeting. So I'm not sure that there's the dissonance there that we'd like to, some would like to see in those numbers between today's data and those actual dots. I think what it probably did was took mm -hmm. out of play some people who might have had hikes in their interest rate scenario for 2024 that then moved them to the zero um, portion, those four people who voted for no change in rates. But I think that's very important is that the Fed has also been very careful not to declare victory, as Julia said at the beginning, at the end of the last um, show. And I think that's really important. They don't go out and say mission accomplished. They are very deliberative right now in terms of not getting too far ahead of themselves until the data comes to them. Now, I disagree that that's, you know, sort of neutral and doesn't cause any harm. Data dependence, the data are lagged. And so by the time the data comes to you, even if you're willing to settle in to a higher rate, ultimately, it's still lagged and it could be after the fact. And I think that's what you see in terms of the nervousness with Jay Powell, right. because he worries much more than some of his colleagues about over tightening. Diane Swank, I, I look at where we are and what the key thing is, as Bob Michael said, is we're beyond the first quarter of this year, the lethargy, the slowdown, maybe some of the fear of the first quarter. What is your take on the state of the American economy as they stagger to September and December? Well, we're still in an economy that's generating a lot of jobs. You know, the household survey and the establishment survey aren't quite synced up. They haven't been synced up for a long time, in part because we're undercounting the number of immigrants in the country, and that's not fully showing up in the household survey as well. But we do know that we continue to generate jobs. We continue to generate paychecks. And if the last month's report is to be believed, and we have to be careful on that, that we actually saw an acceleration in wages, that's something to sort of, I think, take with a grain of salt. But at the end of the day, this is an economy that for the moment is still hanging in there, although slowing from what was a stunning pace in 2023. Mohammed, I'd love to bring you back in here. I'm just going through all the different statements, and this is a mess, I mean, in terms of all the differing views. This is not a consensus that you could see that was easily reached. Maybe there it is for right now, but later in this year, 
what the balance of risks here really is all over the map when it comes to uh, the different Fed officials. Do you think that there is too much hawkish talk right now and too much hawkish projections at a time when it seems like the Fed is saying we still haven't done enough, we want to get to 2 percent a little bit sooner, even as we acknowledge this is going to be a battle? Yeah, I think if you were to take the SEP and the statement on face, fully on face value, this would be an overly hawkish policy stand for this economy. Um, among the other things, the fact that we are now at one cut means that given that the Fed will not want the stop, go, stop, go um, cycle, that means that cut comes late in the year, very late in the year. And I agree with Diane, it does matter when you start the cutting cycle. It really does matter. It matters for small businesses. It matters for low-income households. And it matters for the economy. So if you were to take this at face value, then this the market would be selling off right now. But it's not for good reason. And that's what I, I said earlier. Um, and Bob mentioned it as well, is I don't think this fully reflects the latest set of data. And given that this is data dependent Fed, if this had if the data had happened yesterday or the day before, the S&P would look very different than it is today. And that's why the press conference is going to be so critical. And that's why Chair Powell cannot do what Bob wanted him to do <laughs> half an hour ago, because he's really going to have to explain things now. So, Mohammed, based on this, based on the guidance we've got in our hands at the moment, it sounds like December. Are you telling me by the time this news conference finishes, it will sound like September? I suspect so, John. Bob, you agree with that, don't you? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think Diane and Mohammed point out a very important thing, which are the long and variable lags are real. When we look at lower and middle income households, when we look at small businesses, they're struggling with the high cost of everything. They're struggling with the much higher cost of financing those higher prices. And you're seeing it in delinquencies. You're seeing it in, in charge-offs and write-downs um, and losses. Right now, I'm looking at some of the commentary. Some people saying that the reason why there was a hawkish tilt was because of PTSD from the first quarter. Diane, I'd love to hear, think, uh, your take on this. Do you think, and not to be all conspiracy theorists, but do you think that any Fed officials thought to themselves, you know, we should probably be hawkish just to offset the inevitably dovish message that we're going to get from Fed Chair Powell later today. And we can frankly offset that later in this year if the data comes in such. Well, I, 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 no, I don't think that's the case just because I just don't think they think that far ahead on this on this. And I think that's important. Um, I do think that part of what we're seeing here is, yes, they did go in <coughs> to this meeting with a hawkish tilt and then in the data surprise. But we know that, you know, Chair Paul has really changed the dynamics of the SCP, and I'm, I'm just surprised that given the timing of when they write this down, and, you know, the Fed had this data, you know, a lot of the Fed had this data last night, so they've been looking over it, you know, and came in strong with how they were going to talk mm -hmm. about it in the morning, and I think they still have members of the board itself that would have gotten the data that would have said, you know, hey, we're still on the sidelines here, or one cut, and that's it. So I think that's an important way to be thinking about where they're at, about what they think ne they need to be convinced on inflation coming down, not to get to 2%, to cut before they get there, but how much they need to be convinced. That's a lot, and I think they've set that bar pretty high, and it's because they have been head faked in the past. That doesn't mean we couldn't see some big improvement and get to a September cut, but I think we need a lot of improvement from here for the Fed to feel convinced to do a September cut. Suddenly this news conference in 12 minutes got a lot more interesting. Diane Swank of KPMG. Diane, thank you. As always, if you are just tuning in and you missed the Fed decision, it took place about 18 minutes ago. Rates unchanged as expected. Big focus on the median dot. Basically, all the Fed officials get together. They plot where they think rates should be, will be for 24, 25 and beyond. You take the median dot. And a lot of people on Wall Street see that as a signal of how many times they're going to cut in any given year. That median dot was at three cuts for this year. It's come all the way down to one. Worth noting, though, that they now see four cuts in 2025, more than the three that they previously outlined. So they've pushed some of that into next year. But the range of views, I think the median marks a very, very divided <coughs> Fed. And Lisa did a fantastic job of that a little bit earlier, really explaining it, Lisa, that four policymakers see 
no cuts this year. Seven anticipate just one reduction. Eight are looking for two. That's the Federal Reserve that's all over the place. And that really does have at least uh, half of it a really hawkish tilt right now at a time when other people are saying, you know, we'll do it for the Fed. Mission accomplished. So it raises this question at this point. What is keeping them from really going all in on the macular disinflation? Is it just PTSD from Q1? And will all of the sort of questions that people have around the hawkishness just disappear in the wake of the bomb that Jay Powell tends to bring us. Mike Gapen of Bank of America is with us now for more. Mike Gapen, I was sharing your words a little bit earlier, that quote from you, one giant leap for the Fed. Then I explained that you still don't think they cut until December, so it's not that big a leap. What do you make of what you've heard in the last 20 minutes or so? Well, if we thought it was a September uh, or sooner cut, maybe it'd be one giant leap for mankind instead of the, the Fed. Like, I, I think what... What Bob and Muhammad have been saying here, I think I would I would share, which is I think the data is probably more important than than the dots in in this case because it is such a data dependent Fed. They don't want to take these structural longer term views, so they'll be reactionary. So maybe that the dots kind of lag what's happening um, on the ground. Look, I, I would just characterize all this as an incremental shift in in Fed thinking that that they were trying to target us to the middle of the year, inflation didn't cooperate, so they shifted right. things back. Um, I would encourage them, like Mohammed is saying, to take some stands on longer term, longer term structural views, but I just, this is not right. the Fed that, that we have. Michael, how ex post are they? I go back to the Bank of America work of their very retired Ethan Harris's wonderful book, Ben Bernanke's Fed. Okay, great. Are we still back at Ben Bernanke or Alan Greenspan's Fed? where they are exceptionally ex post? I don't think so. I, I think, I just think it's a, they believe, I think as you're noting in the dots, there's a wide disparity of views and sometimes pulling the view out of the median is a, is a fool's errand. So it may just be that there's not a lot of structural or agreement about these longer term structural issues. So it's hard for them to be forecast based. And so you just get a plethora of views. And so they throw their arms up and say, fine, there's a lot of uncertainty. The only thing we can trust is the data under our feet. So that's what we'll focus on for better or worse. Michael, what would be your question to Fed Chair Powell this afternoon? Uh, how much was the data this morning reflected in the projections and, and the dots? If, if the answer is yes, it sounds a, a little hawkish. If, if, if the answer is no, then you can make a case for September still being on the board. I think the data could make a September cut viable. We just think it all comes together in, in December. So the dots and the forecasts are, are kind of a, a mic forecast right now. So I'm pretty pleased with those. Mohammed and Bob, I've got the same thoughts. Let me tell you. Mike Gapen of Bank of America. Mike, thank you, sir. Mohammed, I wanted to come across to you on the forecast, but not on the dots. I wanted to talk about unemployment. When they reflect on what we learned on Friday, and you were with us, working through that payrolls report. Just the difference between the two surveys. How do you think this FOMC is navigating that at the moment? I think it's navigating like everybody else, um, trying to maintain optionality, trying to understand what's going on. And it's not just the employment data. We've had a lot of competing macro data. So, you know, they're just waiting. Um, I do think there's two things going on. Certainly the uncertainty is making them data dependent, but there's something else that's making them data dependent, is what happened in 2021. When, when they did take a view on inflation, they took a strategic view on inflation, and it turned out to be really wrong. And I think they've been burnt, and they don't want to go back to that fire anytime soon. So they will not be reconcil trying to reconcile the data. They will not be taking trying to anchor markets and their own thinking with a forward looking view, they're going to continuously react to the latest set of data. And that's what I think you're going to see. Which could be good and it could be bad. According to you, Mohammed Bob, I'd love to bring you back in at a time when it seems like this is a Fed wrestling with itself. The consensus on the top is a mirage. Sure, there's consensus not to cut rates at this meeting, but that's pretty much it. What does that signal for you in terms of the clarity of purpose of their policy going forward and how to really navigate around it? Great question. If I were Mike McKee, I'd ask the Fed, have the summary of economic projections outlived their usefulness? Do they do more harm than good? And if the answer is no, then I'm sitting here, we're told to look at the summary of economic projections and it's reflecting a Fed that's confused. 
And you know what? Even if they, they submitted the um, projections <coughs> before the CPI data, one bit of data shouldn't create that much of a change. So this is a confused Fed. What that tells me is the bond market is in the hands of people like me. I don't know what the Fed's thinking. I don't know what they're looking at. I don't know what they're going to do. All I know is current levels. I know our projections of where growth and inflation are headed to. I know the amount of buying that's going on now. I know who's waiting on the sidelines. I look at this, it tells me I certainly don't want to be short duration um, or underweight relative to benchmarks. I want to be somewhere around neutral. I want to be mm -hmm. concentrated in the front end of the curve. And I like credit because everything's telling me we're gliding into a soft landing and that's good for corporate America. It's also good for corporate Europe. Dr. Elarian, uh, help me translate this, and you can do this out of the Peeps Library at Cambridge. What in God's name is modest further progress? It is changing a phrase that used to, to, to be somewhat more hawkish to something that is less hawkish but not dovish. That, that is what that is. Mohammed, you've said for a while that maybe they're making a mistake, that they haven't taken this strategic <clears throat> view, and you were hoping they'd go sooner rather than later. Can you help us understand the difference between not going three, but going once, and the difference between doing that one cut at the end of the year, as opposed to doing it in July? What difference does four or five months make? So I love listening to Bob Michaels, um, or oh, is it Bob Michel, John, as you told me last time. Anyway, I love listening to Bob Michaels' <laughs> um, soft landing scenario, because it, it's very soothing, um, but analytically, based on, on how I assess the economy, I give it a 50% probability. It is the dominant scenario, but it is not dominant with high probability. So I have to have a risk mitigation mindset. Um, and then when I look at the tails, I see the tails of recession being larger than the tail of bigger but not hotter economy. Bob Michael, you're so safe. When, when I look at that distribution and I look at the asymmetrical tails, I start asking, what are the buffers in the economy? And that's where I start getting worried. And well, that's where the delay of the, rate, of the rate cut means that those buffers that are already quite limited among small businesses, among low income household, get eroded really quickly. Mohammed, you've been around as long as I have. You're right. We've only seen one soft landing in our investment career, and this is 40 plus years, and that was in 95. So soft landings are incredibly hard to engineer. In fact, just the probabilities are way against you. But what worked in 95 is I think what you're alluding to, the Fed came in and started cutting rates. They cut rates 75 basis points in 95. It was just enough to take the pressure off of businesses and households. And thus, we had, I believe, the only soft landing in our careers. Mohammed, we've got enough time to give you the final word. I love what Bob just said. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed Alarin of Queen's College, Cambridge. <clears throat> Mohammed, thank you.